The Evolution of Civilizations by Carol Quigley Chapter 10 Part 2 Read, recorded, and edited by John Loth Expansion The first stage of expansion in Western civilization lasted for about three centuries, 970 to 1270, and was one of the greatest of such periods in human history. Its instrument of expansion was the feudal system in which a small minority of fighting men and clergy were supported by a great majority of peasants. The contributions of the latter to the former were far greater than the costs of protection and justice they received in return, so that surpluses accumulated in the possession of the upper class. At first these surpluses were used for political ends, to build castles, or to rebuild older timbered fortifications in stone. But soon investment in economic activities began. This appeared either in agriculture or in the encouragement of long-distance commerce in luxury goods. The agricultural expansion was extensive, and took the form of establishing manors in unfilled areas by clearing wastelands or forests, or by draining swamplands. When this was done by secular lords, the new manors were generally similar to the older manors of the self-sufficient, balanced, three-field type. But increasingly, the manners spread by clerical, above all by monastic groups, were of a new type, producing still the basic needs of their own inhabitants, but adding to this an increasing surplus output of some product for sale off the manor. In grassy or hilly areas, these surplus products from the new manors were likely to be wool, wines, or dairy products, chiefly cheeses. But in ordinary terrain, it might be grain. The accumulation of surplus in the hands of the lords, spiritual and temporal, also created a demand for remote luxury goods derived from commerce. From the eastern forests opened by Varangians, there came, by way of the Baltic, various forest products such as furs, honey, wax, and later hemp, tar, and even lumber. From the Levant, there came across the Mediterranean more exotic products, including fine textiles, fine metal products, spices, and dyes. Eventually, links between these two great sea routes were established, the earliest being the Russian river route, then from Italy across the Brainier to Innsbruck, Nuremberg, and the North German rivers, or across the western Alpine passes to the Rhone, Champagne, and the northwestern rivers to the Low Countries. In the first part of the 14th century, an all-sea link was opened by way of the Strait of Gibraltar and Bay of Biscay, to the narrow seas. The revival of commerce, especially in the twelfth century, gave rise to a new social class isolated from the agricultural process, and living in towns rather than on manors. This new middle class, or bourgeoisie, created such a demand for the necessities of life that a new kind of commerce, of local origin and concerned with necessities, appeared. These three innovations, commerce, the middle classes, and town life represented a social and economic revolution in Western society. They led to increased literacy, support for the revival of public authority, new ideas, new morality, and acute religious problems. Taken together, these provide a fairly typical example of stage three in a civilization. The usual characteristics of stage three are easy to identify in the period 1270 to 1300. Increased production, growing population, geographic expansion, and increased knowledge. To a lesser degree, and somewhat belated, can be seen the growth of science, but democratic elements, while present, were unable to develop far because of the continued supremacy of specialized weapons. These kept power securely in the hands of a minority. The old view of our grandfathers that the Middle Ages was a static and backward era is now accepted by almost no one. But it is not so generally recognized that medieval expansion was slowing down by the end of the 13th century, and that the society was entering upon a typical age of conflict. The 300 years of expansion that were drawing to a close as Aquinas died in 1274 had been financed by the demand of the upper classes for luxury goods of distant origin. In time, 
This demand was reinforced and extended by the demands of the successful commercial groups for both luxuries and necessities. But by 1274, the feudal organization, especially the feudal lords, had become institutionalized into an obsolescent structure, with few functions and a powerful determination to resist further change and to defend its own social position. This institutionalized feudalism is called chivalry. As a military system, it was being replaced by royal and ducal forces based on mercenary men-at-arms. As a political influence, it was being replaced by royal and princely rulers served by clerical or even bourgeois officials. These latter had, for the prince, the great advantage that they could count, keep records, and were literate, and yet had no independent military power of their own. Even as a social group, the feudal nobility were being challenged by persons of other origins, such as royal officials, clerical leaders, and wealthy bourgeoisie. The nobility had no desire to continue the process of change that had brought them to this situation, but they were in no position to stop continued development. One of the chief consequences of these economic changes was the advent of a money economy. As a result of this, all relationships in society developed a tendency to become expressed in monetary terms. This was true of the relationships that each noble lord had with his vassals in the feudal system and with his serfs in the manorial system. The aid and counsel owed by the vassal in the former case, as well as the dues and services owed by the serf in the latter, were sooner or later transformed from obligations to pay in kind to obligations to pay in money. Each change was made at the going rate of value, so that the nobles ceased to have fixed incomes in kind and began to have fixed incomes in money. But the steady rise in prices up to 1300 meant that the value of fixed money incomes was steadily reduced. Every year a fixed income would buy less. This rise in prices and equivalent fall in the value of money occurred because both the amount of money in circulation and the speed with which it circulated increased faster than the increase in the volume of goods available, although this was also increasing. The reduction of noble incomes by the decreasing value of money meant that less could be saved from these incomes. Thus there was less and less available for investment. If we consider that the price level was about three times as high in 1300 as it had been at the end of the 10th century, we shall see that a noble who commuted his income into money at the earlier date would have only one-third as much real income at the later date. No one, of course, was quite this badly off, for the simple reason that no one commuted as early as the tenth century, and the later the commutation, the less the loss. But by the end of the thirteenth century, most nobles were being reduced to desperation. This situation was made even worse by the fact that the institutionalization of the nobility led to customary and legal restrictions on their activities that made it very difficult for them to supplement their decreasing real incomes. On the continent generally, but not in England, they were forbidden to engage in commerce or to marry non-noble girls. These restrictions made it impossible for the nobility to obtain access to incomes from the commercial class, as was done in England where there were a peerage and an aristocracy, but no nobility. The result of all these noble misfortunes was that the only feasible way in which a noble could supplement his income was as a mercenary soldier, or, possibly, as a royal bureaucrat. The latter was unlikely because writing and counting were not noble skills. Thus a noble was inclined to seek to supplement his income from war. This need became the basis for the imperialist wars of the Age of Conflict that began at the end of the 13th century. English wars against the Scots, Welsh, Irish, and French. French wars with the English, Burgundians, and others. The almost endless struggles among the princes, both lay and clerical, of Italy and Germany. All these, as well as civil struggles such as the Wars of the Roses, the struggles of the Armagnacs, or the Sicilian Vespers, helped to provide jobs for the impoverished feudal nobility. The economic crisis that emerged from the decrease of feudal spending was delayed only briefly by the continuance of saving and investment by commercial groups. The economic life of the towns, including both commercial and crop activities, became institutionalized in the 14th century, largely by the activities of the guilds. As demand ceased to grow, 
these adopted restrictive regulations, preventing admission of new workers to most activities, and under the pretext of protecting the quality of the products, curtailed output and increased prices. At the same time, towns placed all kinds of restrictions, generally known as municipal mercantilism, on business activities. These included restricting commercial exchange to set times and places, the market, putting restrictions on non-towns people in the town market, forbidding purchases for later sale in the same market, hampering or taxing export of goods from the town, and so forth. All such regulations embodying what is technically called a policy of provision had a very adverse influence on technological advance for most of the 14th century. The decrease in expansion arising from the growth of economic institutionalization was accelerated by a number of other factors. One of these was a fall of prices after 1300, accompanied, within half a century, by a scarcity of labor. The fall of prices probably began with a decrease in demand arising from institutionalization, but it was greatly accelerated by the scarcity of bullion. By the year 1300, the accessible silver mines and scanty gold resources of Europe had been systematically exploited for about four centuries, and most of the easily obtained bullion had been extracted, or were going deeper than could be operated easily by the available technology. The problem of keeping water out of the deeper mines was rapidly becoming insoluble. The ordinary lift pumps, known at the time, would not take water higher than about thirty feet, since they worked by air pressure so that depths greater than this had to be pumped out in multiple stages. Problems of ventilation and of removing ores were also rising rapidly. As a consequence, after about 1320 the annual increase in the bullion supply and thus the increase in the volume of money were less than the increase in production of goods, and the long rise in prices was reversed. Costs, particularly wages, did not fall so rapidly as prices with the result that profit margins, price minus costs, were reduced or wiped out completely. This discouraged production. The situation was alleviated for a short time, just at the middle of the 14th century, because the outbreak of the Hundred Years' War in 1338 helped to strengthen prices, but profit margins hardly benefited at all, because the shortage of labor resulting from the onslaughts of the Black Death after 1348 raised wages. Even today, when wages constitute a smaller portion of total costs, nothing will curtail production faster or more completely than rising wages in a time of falling prices. One rather paradoxical consequence of this situation, one rather paradoxical consequence of this situation, was that incomes were distributed somewhat more equitably, and the standards of living of the poorer groups frequently improved in spite of the general economic decline. This meant that aggregate incomes, as a whole, were decreasing, but the share of the total income going to the working people was rising, and the share of the upper classes was falling quite rapidly. As a consequence of this, both saving and investment, which were upper-class activities, decreased even more rapidly, and the depression worsened. This economic and social crisis of the 14th and early 15th centuries is well documented in the historical records. Josiah C. Russell tells us that the British population was 1.1 million in 1086, and rose very rapidly until about 1240, then increased more slowly during the next century, and achieved a peak of about 3.7 million in 1348. It then decreased to 2.23 million by 1377, and to 2.1 million in the early 15th century, and was still at no more than 3.2 million in 1545. M. M. Poston tells us that all the towns of England, except Bristol and London, lost population from the 14th century to the 15th century. A similar pattern was being experienced on the continent. E. Baratier and F. Renan report the population of Marseillaise fell by at least 75 percent in the period 1263 to 1423. Similar trends have been reported from most of Western and Central Europe. C. M. Kipola says that the crisis of the early decades of the 14th century were comparable in their gravity to those that struck the modern world in 1929 to 1935. In his study of Italian businessmen, 
Why Renaud says that economic enterprise was replaced by warfare after 1330 as the accepted method for making one's fortune. An old work of R. Davidson gives us fairly specific figures for the manufacture of woolen cloth in Florence in the 14th century. 100,000 pieces in 1309, only 70,000 in 1339, falling to 30,000 in 1373, and reaching 19,000 in 1382. Various explanations have been offered for these misfortunes, such as the plague, growing public disorder, increased religious controversy, and others. But however these factors may have acted and reacted on one another, there can be no doubt that by the year 1380 Europe was in the kind of crisis we call an age of conflict. Naturally, there were growing class conflicts as part of these crises. In England, we have the plaints of Langland and uprisings led by men like Watt Tyler and John Ball. In the Low Countries, we find many similar disturbances even earlier, especially 1323 to 1328. In France occurred the revolts of the Jacquerie and other disorders, while in Germany, as a semi-peripheral area, these outbursts came somewhat later, culminating in the peasants' revolts of 1524. All these hardships and disorders led to a growth of irrationality, one of the most typical examples of this to be found in any age of conflict. All kinds of irrational heresies, like the Flagellants or the Beguins, became rampant in Europe. Witchcraft, astrology, even devil worship, dances of death, necromancy, and all degrees of despair and emotional desperation were prevalent. The tone of the age is clearly revealed in a man like Villian, and well described by modern writers like Johann Heusinger or Millard Mies. The geographic expansion of Christendom, which reached its peak with Marco Polo, 1271 to 1295, largely ceased with that achievement and was only resumed a century later with the exploits of the Portuguese in a new age of expansion. Second Expansion The debasement of Europe's material, social, and spiritual life, which had continued for over a century and a half, was reversed quite suddenly, just before the middle of the 15th century. About 1440, new life began to spring up, with new hopes and renewed ambitions. This new growth was based on the activities of a new instrument of expansion, commercial capitalism. A complete circumvention of the previous feudal organization that had originated the older period of expansion in the 10th century. This new instrument of expansion, which we call commercial capitalism, was a circumvention of feudalism, but it could just as well be regarded as a reform of the commercial organization of the Middle Ages. In the earlier period, Demand, originally of feudal origin, had given rise to a commercial system whose symbols are Brugs, Venice, and Nuremberg. In the new age of expansion, which began about 1440, the original demand came from princes and dynastic monarchies, and gave rise to a new commercial organization whose symbols are Cadiz, Antwerp, and London. One aspect of the change is the shift from institutionalized Mediterranean commerce to instrumental Atlantic commerce. After the original impulse, feudalism, or dynastic monarchy as the case may be, both organizations were capitalistic and commercial. By capitalism we mean an economic system motivated by the pursuit of profits within a price structure. Such profits can be derived either from the exchange of goods, as happened in commercial capitalism, or from the production of goods, as occurred in the third period of Western expansion which began about 1720. Either type of capitalism can become institutionalized, in which case profits are sought not from exchange or from production of goods, but from restrictions on exchange and restrictions on production. This restrictive capitalism arose because profits, which are the real motive of any capitalistic system, are the margin between selling prices and costs. As long as capitalistic organization is an instrument it seeks to increase profits by reducing costs rather than by increasing prices. But when a capitalistic system becomes an institution, it shifts its efforts to trying to increase profits by increasing prices. Such increases in prices can generally be achieved only by reducing the flow of goods, either by restricting exchange or by restricting production. 
in effort to make this chief method for maximizing profits, indicates institutionalization of the organization. We have three different names for institutionalized capitalist systems, which were dominant in the three ages of conflict of Western civilization. These are municipal mercantilism in the period 1270 to 1440, state mercantilism in the period 1690 to 1810, and monopoly capitalism in the period 1900 and after. The new age of expansion after 1440 lasted until near the end of the 17th century. It is very familiar to all students of history and is frequently called the ambiguous term Renaissance. Even a neophyte in the study of history is aware that this period possessed the qualities we have listed as typical of any age of expansion. Increased production, rising population, geographic expansion, growth of knowledge, and intermittent impulses of science and democracy. Except for geographical expansion and science, all these were probably less extreme, in a quantitative sense, than history textbooks might lead us to believe, but I think there can be no doubt that they existed sufficiently to justify the name expansion for the period as a whole. The two most dramatic aspects of the period, however, are to be seen in science and in exploration and colonization. In science, the period from Copernicus, or even Leonardo, to Newton is recognized as one of the most brilliant in all history, while in geographic expansion, the age of Vasco da Gama, or Magellan, is no less famous. In both of these fields, and in the others as well, the period of a century or more after 1690 is one of much more modest achievements. Only in the 19th century, with the surge of a new age of expansion, were the achievements of the 16th and early 17th centuries generally exceeded. The successive stages of expansion and conflict that we are trying to distinguish in the past thousand years of the history of our own civilization are even less definitely demarked than, than similar stages in other civilizations. In addition to certain difficulties already mentioned, such as the inevitable lack of perspective occurring when we study our own society, there are other difficulties that arise from the cyclical character of these stages. Culture lag and aberrations that emerge from the contrast between core and peripheral zones are especially troublesome in a civilization that repeats stages. We have already mentioned the problems that arise in demarking stages from the fact that such stages tend to be somewhat later in peripheral areas than they are in core areas. When stages are repeated, as in Western civilization, this gives rise to particular difficulties because peripheral areas could, in theory, fall one full stage behind the core area and thus mask the fluctuating process in the civilization as a whole. Fortunately, Western civilization did not have a full stage lag in its peripheral areas, but the lag was sufficiently prolonged to provide a masking influence on the demarcations of stages. In general, the core of Western civilization could be regarded as the northern half of Italy, France, the Low Countries, extreme Western Germany, and England without its Celtic fringes. The masking effect arose because of continued expansion in Germany and in the New World after this core had already moved into the next stage. There can be little doubt that the shift from expansion to conflict that occurred in the core of Western Europe at the end of the 13th century arrived somewhat later in Germany. Again, when Western Europe resumed expansion about 1440, Germany continued in the period of conflict for another century. And finally, when the second stage of expansion reached its end in Western Europe in the late 17th century, it continued in Germany and in Mexico for several generations more. On the other hand, about 1840, when England, France, and above all, Belgium were expanding vigorously in the third occurrence of expansion of Western civilization, Germany and Mexico were just about to resume expansion. The masking effect between stages to which we refer was intensified by cultural lag. This means that in any single area, be it core or not, all aspects of the society do not start, stop, or proceed at the same times and rates. In general, change or innovation was earlier in the military and economic aspects than it was in the political, social, legal, or intellectual aspects.
This can be seen quite clearly in the early 16th century, and again in the late 18th century. The last imperialist war of the first age of conflict was the series of struggles called the Italian Wars, 1494 to 1559. These began with an excuse rather than a cause, just as the earlier Hundred Years' War, 1338 to 1445, had done. The cause of both of these was the need for the institutionalized feudal system to wage war in order to make a living. In other words, war had become an end in itself, as is usually the case with any institution. The excuse given in 1338 for the English invasion of France, like the excuse given in 1494 for Charles VIII's invasion of Italy, was no more than that, just an excuse, a flimsy dynastic claim to a distant throne. But in each case, hordes of unemployed nobles were eager to support such a claim, no matter how flimsy, for the sake of booty and payment for military service. The first imperialist wars of the new age of conflict were the wars of Louis XIV, which began in 1667, and which continued, with interruptions, until after Waterloo in 1815. The excuses that Louis XIV gave for his wars were just about as flimsy as those which had been offered in 1338 and 1494 in the earlier ages of conflict, and were repeated in the last of these wars by Napoleon. As far as our analysis goes, the Italian wars of 1494 to 1559 should have been followed by a period of peace such as followed the Napoleonic Wars of 1803 to 1815. Since, in each case, a new period of expansion had begun, let us note that expansion had fully begun even before these last imperialist wars commenced, since the Second Age of Expansion began about 1440, and the Third began about 1730. This was simply a result of cultural lag, and reflected a situation where older institutions continued to work for a war that newer instrumental developments had made unnecessary and unrewarding. A similar and parallel situation may be existing now, at the middle of the twentieth century, if we are endangered by imperialist war at a time when new instruments and techniques of peaceful expansion have already begun to function. In the period 1815 to 1914, of course, there was an absence of imperialist war, and Europe was generally concentrating its resources and energies on expansion, and did so because the fact of expansion, especially the new industrialism, was too obvious for anyone to ignore the fact that it was more feasible to get ahead by peaceful methods than by warlike ones. But in the period of expansion from 1440 to 1680, this was not nearly so clear chiefly because of cultural lag of behavior and thought patterns from the earlier age of conflict. We have said that the Italian wars began in 1494 as a typical imperialist aggression by the institutionalized feudal system, but the war changed its character after about 25 years and became a balance of power struggle against Habsburg hegemony. In 1494, the King of France was the aggressor. By 1520, the King of France was fighting for survival against a dynastic monster that had come into existence through a series of circumstances, some of them accidental, which had made the Habsburgs the overwhelming power in Europe. Among these circumstances were the family arrangements that accumulated by inheritance a large number of important dynastic claims in the hands of Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. Of almost equal importance was the accidental circumstance that the same Habsburgs, as rulers of Mexico and Peru, were able to tap the immense resources of bullion of America at a time when the existence of mercenary armies made money equivalent to soldiers, and thus to power. The influx of American bullion that made the Habsburgs a great military and political power, without an economic or social system capable of supporting a hegemony of Europe, had several results. By raising prices rapidly, it completed the ruin of the older nobility and any other persons on fixed incomes. At the same time, this price inflation gave a great spur to economic, especially commercial expansion, and to the growth in wealth and influence of the bourgeoisie and richer peasants. Moreover, the revelation that the possession of money could make a dynasty powerful 
even without a sound economic or social system to support it, fastened the mercantilist system in a broader, more exploitative way upon Europe. Political power supported by mercenary soldiers was used to regulate economic activities, so that a favorable balance of trade would bring in sufficient money to hire mercenary soldiers, and thus expand a dynasty's ability to control more taxpayers, get access to larger numbers of mercenary recruits, and to increase the favorable balance of payments. These obsolescent ideas, which continued as a cultural lag during the course of the new Second Age of Expansion, ensured a continuance of imperialist wars even in the period of expansion. The struggle against Habsburg hegemony that began after 1519 was ended with the Habsburg's political defeat in the Thirty Years' War, 1618-1648. The struggle against French hegemony in Europe that began in 1667 continued until 1815, but the interval between these two struggles, which should have been a period of peace, was not because of economic struggles such as the three Anglo-Dutch wars, which were justified by institutionalized mercantilist ideologies. Moreover, only local and sporadic movements toward democracy appeared in this period of expansion, because the organization of military force and of political power was not such as to permit democracy to function. The Italian wars of 1494 to 1559 were like a cauldron, in which a great variety of military ideas and tactics were thrown together and tested. Among these were the mounted knight, the new infantry of English crossbowmen or Swiss pikemen, the even newer infantry of arquebusiers, the light cavalry reiter armed with horse pistols, primitive artillery, and even a Spanish revival of the Roman legionary. From the competition of these various arms there emerged by 1559 a tactical combination of pike and arquebus, that held the field for over two centuries. In this combination, the pikemen defended the arquebus against charging horsemen, while the arquebusiers defended the pikemen against four arms. At first, slowness of reloading, which left arquebusiers in jeopardy from cavalry for long intervals, required a high ratio of pikemen in the unit. But the slow increase in rate of firing and the invention of the ring bayonet, which made each musketeer able to act as his own pikeman, in 1690, led to the reduction and eventual elimination of pikes. But the use of muskets, either with pikes or bayonets for defense against cavalry, supplemented by artillery, remained a skilled task as long as guns remained muzzle-loading, spark-ignited weapons. Such skill could be obtained only from professional mercenary soldiers in the relatively small numbers that could be paid by dynastic monarchies in the mercantilist period. In this period, the organizational feature of small professional mercenary armies was reinforced by the fact that arms were handmade on a piece-by-piece -piece basis and were thus too expensive for the average private citizen to obtain or for the public fist to purchase on a mass basis. Accordingly, it is not surprising that political power remained concentrated in a narrow group who controlled this limited supply of weapons and did not spread to that majority who were relatively isolated from war and weapons, and thus had no basis on which to establish any claims for participation in governmental functions. This narrow basis for military activity in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries fully sustains the narrow distribution of political power in the same period. Accordingly, it became relatively easy for the vested interest groups to defend the status quo and to prevent structural changes when the new period of crises began at the end of the 17th century. Second Age of Conflict The second period of expansion in Western civilization was transformed into a second age of conflict when the instrument of expansion became an institution. The two phases of this organization are generally called commercial capitalism and state mercantilism. The preceding period of mercantilism, which we call municipal mercantilism, generally had been regulated by municipal political units rather than by the wider monarchical political units of the 18th century. It had been dominated by the interests of the consumer and had reflected this concern in a policy of provision that put restrictions on exports but not on imports and tried to regulate craft activities to protect quality. By 1400 this policy had become very restrictive. 
the second phase of mercantilism was organized on a different basis, with different aims, since it was generally regulated by dynastic monarchies and generally sought to protect the interests of commercial groups. As such, it had no interest in restricting either imports or exports, but rather sought to make goods go through the territory so that fees of handling and the profits of exchange could be insured to the citizens. This is frequently called the policy of the staple, and contrasts both with the policy of provision of the first age of conflict and with the policy of protection of the third age of conflict that associated with monopoly capitalism after 1900. These three policies represent the interests of three different aspects of the economic system. Any economic system must provide production, distribution, and consumption. Each of the three ages of conflict of Western civilization sought to protect the vested interests of one of these aspects, but in the reverse order, so that the consumer was dominant in the first period, about 1400, the trader was dominant in the second, about 1750, and the producer was dominant in the third, about 1930. Any effort to make means into ends, or to make one section or aspect of a process the dominant interest of the whole process, is a clear indication of institutionalization. This process of institutionalization can be seen as a kind of general stagnation of Western civilization during most of the century from 1650 to 1750. The geographic expansion that had spread in such a phenomenal way in the period 1450 to 1650 began to hesitate. In North America, the colonies remained east of the Appalachians, or, in some areas, below the fall line. In South America, the incredible explorations of the earlier period, which, for example, had seen the continent crossed from west to east by way of the Amazon, were not repeated until the 19th century. In the history of Africa, we find a similar situation. In most areas of the Dark Continent, there were widespread explorations and missionary activities, even a transcontinental journey in the 16th century, but then nothing similar occurred again until the 19th century. Expansion into India and the Far East shows a similar but less drastic hesitancy. The same cycle can be seen in legislation, which devoted itself, after about 1650, to the defense of the status quo, or to the effort, by political action, to obtain a larger share for oneself of what was regarded as a static and unexpandable body of the world's wealth. This can be seen in the navigation acts that the English colonies in America so resented in the period after 1765, but that were first enacted after 1649. These acts sought to prevent economic innovations in the colonies and to force their trade and commodities to go through England and English hands, whatever their ultimate destination. At the same time, within England, technical innovation was discouraged. Work became an end in itself, and laws were made to preserve existing markets as they stood. In a semi-statistical study, Change and History, published in 1952, Margaret T. Hodgkin found three periods of technical innovation in Western history. These were the 11th century to the 14th century, the 16th century, and the 19th century. Governments did all they could to discourage such innovation in the late 17th century, in contrast to the late 16th, when they still sought to reward it. In England, the patent power was used to prevent new techniques rather than to encourage them. As early as 1623, the Privy Council ordered destruction of a machine for making needles, cloth buttons rather than bone, forbidden in 1698, while Indian calico was forbidden in 1686. A law of 1666 ordered all persons to be buried in wool rather than in the traditional linen. Every effort was made to prevent new techniques in the textile industry, and thus, in effect, to hamper the growth of cotton textiles. In France, these efforts culminated in the Crafts Codes of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, issued in seven volumes of 2,200 pages over the period 1666 to 1730. These sought to prescribe every detail of the established craft techniques and to proscribe innovations in these. Economic aims and economic values were distorted 
and frequently reversed, so that consumption was condemned as an evil, abundance abhorred, work praised as an end in itself, exporting encouraged, and poverty regarded as a good, because it was the only way to keep people working. The esteemed Sir William Petty, 1662, believed that a country could get richer and richer by exporting more and more, and that it would be a good thing if the products of the labor of a thousand men could be burned, since these men could then keep their skills by having to make the goods over again. Charles Davenant, in 1698, wrote, By what is consumed at home, one loseth only what another gets, and the nation in general is not all the richer, but all foreign consumption is a clear and certain profit. More briefly, in 1673, Becker wrote, All selling is good, all buying bad. While in 1677, John Hewton drew a logical conclusion from these ideas by suggesting that England could get richer by inviting foreigners to come in to consume our corn, cattle, cloths, coals, and other things. It was suggested that an enemy in wartime could be greatly weakened if he could be flooded with goods, and, as late as 1810, that last great mercantilist, Napoleon, issued licenses to smugglers to carry goods into England secretly. De Mandeville praised vice because it was unproductive, while Defoe praised a law forbidding a more efficient canal boat able to do the same work with fewer men. It can hardly be expected that ideas and settlements such as these could be fitted together to provide any self-consistent and convincing economic theory. But even as they stand, they reveal a determination to defend isolated vested interests such as prevail in a period of institutionalized organizations. As might be expected in such a period, the century 1650 to 1750 was one of imperialist wars, of class conflicts, of flattening population expansion, of softening prices, and of irrational confusions. Of these, the class conflicts and imperialist wars continued until 1815, although a new age of expansion had begun as early as 1730. Napoleon was the culmination of this age of conflict, seeking to establish a universal empire, and almost succeeding in the core area by 1811 seeking to enforce his mercantilist conceptions with the full authority of his imperial system, and quite convinced that he was living in a limited world in which one share could be increased only if another were curtailed. In these wars Napoleon was fighting the wave of the future, with the methods of the past. This can be seen quite clearly if we merely look at four or five aspects of the new nineteenth century of expansion. In financial matters, one of the great problems of Western civilization from the earliest period had been fluctuations and, above all, limitations on the volume of money. So long as money was in the form of specie, there could be no close correlation between the volume of money available and the economic need for money as a medium of savings and exchange. The volume of money was strictly related to the supply of bullion, except for minor influences, like hoarding, flows of specie to India and the East, and such. But this supply was in no way related to economic needs. We have seen that the supply increased too rapidly in the three centuries, 1000 to 1300, then increased far too slowly because of exhaustion of existing mines within the framework of the existing technology for the next century and a half, 1300 to 1450 then was expanded in a spectacular and accidental way, quite out of relationship to economic need, by Spanish access to the bullion stores of Mexico and Peru, 1450 to 1650. But that the diffusion of these stores left the economy of Western civilization on an inflated price level that could not be sustained by any continued increase in bullion supplies. Thus, by the late 17th century, and much of the 18th century, the flow of bullion was not sufficient to satisfy either the demands for an expanding economic system or those of a mercantilist political system supported by a mercenary military system. This inadequacy began to be remedied at the very end of the 17th century. Notably, 
by the establishment of the Bank of England in 1694. This remedy rested on the use of banknotes backed to only a fractional part of their value by specie reserves. This was a partial solution of the problem of money for two reasons. One, it permitted a great increase in the volume of money when the supply of bullion was increasing inadequately. And two, it permitted the volume of money to fluctuate to some extent in response to changing needs for money in the economy. This new technique of monetary manipulation became one of the basic factors in the great age of expansion in the 19th century and made the fluctuations of economic activities less responsive to the rate of bullion production from mines by making it more responsive to new factors reflecting the demand for money, such as the interest rate. This new technique spread relatively slowly in the century between the founding of the Bank of England and Napoleon's creation of the Bank of France in 1803. The Napoleonic Wars, because of the backward, specie-based financial ideas of Napoleon, were, on their fiscal side, a struggle between the older, bullionist, obsolete system favored by Napoleon and the new fractional reserve banknote system of England. A similar situation existed in regard to food production. No very impressive economic expansion was possible in the 18th century without some new agricultural techniques capable of increasing the output of food. No such increase could be expected so long as the medieval three-field system, with its unenclosed scattered strips and free-ranging farm animals, continued. This medieval system had been a great success in its day, greatly superior to the old classical two-field slave system, and capable of supporting the new Western civilization through its first two ages of expansion. But by 1650 its output per man day of work was not sufficient to support any notable increase of the proportion of the population in crafts and trade, and it was of course quite incapable of providing the food or raw materials for industrialism. This medieval organization of agriculture was fully institutionalized by 1650 and had become a great obstacle to continued expansion. Just at that point, however, there became available in Western Europe the elements of a new agrarian system fully capable of supporting a new period of expansion and destined to do so in the 19th century. The new organization of agriculture is usually known as the Agricultural Revolution. In essence, it abandoned the three-field system for a leguminous rotation system, in which a leguminous crop was put in place for the fallow stage, in the older three-stage cycle. Such a leguminous crop, like alfalfa or clover, put much more nitrogen in the field than any fallow year ever could. But it required a major reorganization in livestock handling. Animals had to be fenced in rather than fenced out of the arable field as in the older system, because the fallow and, to a lesser degree, the stubble on which medieval livestock had foraged were gone. Fencing in of animals or enclosure had three important results. One, selective breeding could be practiced, with a great improvement in the quality of farm animals. Two, animal manure was now available in quantity to be used where its fertility was most needed. And three, feed had to be supplied to the animals, thus providing a use for the leguminous crop that had been put into the fallow stage of the older cycle. There was thus a drastic increase in size, quality, and numbers of farm animals as a consequence of the agricultural revolution. As an index of this, we might note that the slaughter weights of farm animals tripled at Smithfield Market in England during the 85-year period ending in 1795. The agricultural revolution did not cease with the factors we have mentioned, but included a number of other significant items. Enclosure ejected a considerable number of subsistent peasants from the agrarian system, and led to larger holdings and some degree of rural depopulation, thus providing manpower for increased commerce and industry. It also made possible numerous other technical advances, many of them associated with the ideas of rural eccentrics like Jethro Tool, 1711. These included planting of seed in rows, in holes in the ground, 
by use of a seed drill instead of broadcast surface sowing, as in the Middle Ages. This encouraged seed selection and the use of horse-drawn cultivators. The agricultural revolution was the basis of the new age of expansion that began in England about 1730, but that had not yet reached France a generation later. This fact was perfectly clear to Arthur Young when he traveled in France just before the French Revolution. As a consequence, the Napoleonic Wars were, from this point of view, a conflict between the older three-field fallow system and the newer enclosed leguminous rotation systems, frequently called in France and elsewhere the Norfolk system. There was also a third important element in this situation. This was the shift from a craft system of manufacture to an industrial system. The vital point about this shift is not so much the growth of the factory system or the growth of an urban proletariat that did not own the tools it used, but to the shift from an economy in which production was achieved by energy released in living bodies, man or animal powered, to one in which production was achieved by energy released through non-living mechanisms, water power, or steam engines. This shift, which permitted great increases in production of manufactured goods, would never have been possible without the agricultural revolution that preceded it, and possibly without the advent of a fractional reserve banking system as well. The change, which is usually called the Industrial Revolution, was in full development in England, but was largely unknown in France during the Napoleonic Wars. In this regard also, these wars represented a conflict between a newer organization for fulfilling human desires and an older obsolescent one. There is a fourth way in which the Napoleonic Wars represented a struggle between the new and the old. On the Napoleonic side we find ranged all the forces of mercantilism, meaning the theories and the vested interest forces that believed that economic life had to be regulated by the government and regulated for largely political ends. This system played a very significant role in Western civilization in the period 1200 to 1800, but by the latter date it was clearly obsolete and had to be replaced by a more advanced system. This newer system of economic management is known as laissez-faire, and, as is well known, it was associated with the period of expansion of the 19th century. What is not so well known, however, is what the shift from one to another really entailed. Every economic system has to be regulated. That is, somehow, decisions must be made as to what is produced, how much of it, and who gets it. The early Middle Ages, and again in the late 19th century, the European system of management was an unregulated automatic one. That is, no centralized decision-making occurred in either, but the two were entirely dissimilar in the ways that this came about. In the medieval system, economic regulation was automatic through medieval custom. What was produced, how much, and who got it were established on the basis of what had been done at an earlier date. Custom ruled. In the 19th century, once again, Europe had an automatic management of economic life, but now it was a dynamic economic system, not the static one of the earlier Middle Ages. And, as a dynamic system, it could not be regulated by custom. Instead, it was regulated by the market. The market is a place where buyers and sellers come together to exchange their goods. In an automatic laissez-faire market, numerous sellers compete with each other, thus forcing prices downward, while simultaneously numerous buyers compete with each other, thus forcing prices upward. And finally, during all this, buyers higgle with sellers. As a consequence of these three forces operating in the market, a price is reached at which goods are exchanged for money in terms that will clear the market of both. Such a market mechanism is fully capable, as we all know, of determining without centralized control what will be produced, how much will be made, and who will get it. But no laissez-faire system can do this unless a market exists and no such market can exist unless both transportation and communications are so highly developed and so free that people know what is going on and both goods and money are free to move where each is more valuable. Neither transportation nor communication were adequate to this purpose 
when the customary system of the static medieval economy began to break down from the introduction of dynamic economic influences about the year 1000. Thus, there was no market in the year 1000, and there was still no market, although a myriad of small markets in 1700. These small markets existed from the inadequacy of both transportation and communication, and were small in the sense that the numbers of buyers and the numbers of sellers in each market were too small to prevent monopolistic or oligopolistic prices and to achieve competitive prices. To prevent this, and to protect the consumer from exploitation, municipal mercantilism grew up and dominated economic regulation during the period 1200 to 1500 approximately. As improvements in transportation and communications appeared in the period of medieval expansion, there was a tendency for the numerous small markets regulated by municipal mercantilism to flow together to create fewer and larger markets. These larger markets, drawing from areas larger than the areas of municipal control and similarly supplying goods to larger areas, could not be controlled by municipal authorities. Still, these authorities continued to attempt to do what was technically beyond their powers to do. These efforts, aiming at the defense of established vested interests rather than at the protection of consumers, as originally intended, are part of the institutionalized structure of the first age of conflict. As a consequence of the inability of municipal authorities to regulate the newer, larger markets created by improved transportation and communications, this task was taken over by the emerging dynastic monarchies. We have already shown how changes in weapons, political organization, and political ideology had created these newer political structures with power to regulate economic life over larger areas. This newer economic regulation by dynastic monarchies is known as state mercantilism. It aimed to protect traders rather than consumers or producers. Much of the expansion of the second period of expansion arose from its efforts. By the 18th century, state mercantilism had become, in its turn, a structure of vested interests, serving to hamper economic life rather than to help it. This was as true of traders as it was of consumers and producers. This shift of state mercantilism from an instrument to an institution was based on two chief features. On one hand, the organization was no longer used for an economic purpose, but had become an end in itself with largely political purposes. It was used to increase state power rather than for economic life. On the other hand, by the late 18th century, transportation and communication were again beginning to improve so rapidly that continental and even world markets were coming into existence. These were, of course, much wider than the areas of power of the dynastic monarchies and accordingly could not be controlled by them. The continued efforts of governments to exercise such control in the portions of markets that fell in their respective power areas merely served to create restrictions on economic life and hampered production, exchange, and consumption alike. This situation was shown by Adam Smith in his book The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Clearly, markets were now large enough to be regulated by supply and demand, by competition and higgling and any movement to allow this would be economically progressive. From this point of view, also, the Napoleonic Wars represented a struggle between an older and younger system. Thus, from four points of view concerned with finance, agriculture, manufacturing, and economic regulation, the political struggles between England and France in the Napoleonic period reflected a contrast between the future and the past. There are, of course, numerous other factors involved in this contrast. Some of these will be mentioned in the next section, but these four should be sufficient to show that Napoleon represented an outmoded system and that he was the last phase of a fairly typical age of conflict. The other marks of such an age of conflict, with one notable exception, are fairly obvious or have been mentioned already. The exception is in intellectual history where an age of conflict usually is a period of irrationality. This is, of course, not a term that could be applied to the 18th century, where the more usual label, 
at least for the generation 1730 to 1790, is enlightenment. This discrepancy is but one indication of a situation that is far too complex to be discussed here, namely that periodization of intellectual history is quite different from the periodization of other aspects of society. In these other aspects, we can distinguish five successive stages on each level over the period from A.D. 950 into the future, but on the intellectual level, as shown in the chart, see page 389, we have at least nine stages over the same time. To some extent, this can be explained by cultural lag, but there are other influences quite as significant including the much weaker degree of integration between one theory and another, even at the same time, or between a theory and another aspect of the society, than exists between the more concrete aspects of culture. At any period, it is possible for a thinker either to accept a theory which is morphologically compatible with his age, or to reject it. In such cases, the ideology of the age must be sought in the generally unstated assumptions made both by conformists and nonconformists. In the 18th century, the Enlightenment was nonconformist to the other levels of the society, and this is, indeed, one of the chief causes of the French Revolution. The rational, orderly, organized qualities of the Enlightenment were quite incompatible with the irrational, disorderly, and disorganized society of the day, and thus gave rise to tensions that reinforced from other directions, provided the energy motivating the French Revolution. The irrationality to be associated with the second age of conflict might be sought either in the intellectual stage that preceded the Enlightenment, or with the Romantic movement that followed it. In the former case, it would be associated with such items as the political theory of Hobbes, and with Jansenism, while in the latter case, it would be associated with the literary movements that began with Richardson and Macpherson's Ossian, and developed into Rousseau, Sturm und Drang, Wordsworth, and others of the political theories of men like Burke, Fichte, Bonald, or de Maistre, and the religious movements represented by Methodism. On the whole, it seems preferable, without being dogmatic, to associate the latter intellectual stage with the irrationalism we expect from an age of conflict. But at any rate, the subject is too complicated to be discussed in any satisfactory way here.